It's a great honor for me to present today the uh, opening lecture of this fantastic forum that uh, includes experts from all over the world. Welcome, and I hope to somehow answer some of the questions that uh, we have been asking over the years uh, on absorption. In chronic hemodialysis patients, we have a sicker and comorbid population. Suboptimal middle and long-term outcomes are present. In critically ill kidney patients, we have often sepsis-associated AKI, new clinical scenarios including multiple organ dysfunction syndrome, and there is a lack of adequate pharmacological treatment. So innovation is mandatory. To overcome several unmet clinical needs of current blood purification, to utilize at the best the advances in technology and biomaterials, and to fulfill the required saving due to financial constraint in a resource-limited environment. The areas of innovation may be different. Biomaterials, nanotechnology, microfluidics, new devices, techniques, water sparing and environmental friendly solutions, simplification and integration of extracorporeal blood purification therapies. What is the role of sorbent technology in this innovation? Using a Chinese uh, term, learn from the past to imagine the future by Confucius, I think we should actually explore the past the present, and possibly imagine the future. So back to the past for a moment. The, the history of sorbent goes back a couple of centuries ago with the first inorganic alumosilicates used to exchange ammonium and calcium. Then we used this uh, for water softeners, zeolites, and in 1935, uh, almost 100 years ago, Adams own synthesized the first organic ion exchange resin that was subsequently modified using styrene or acrylic acid bees in order to create the amber light, the dual light, the pure light resin that started to be used in blood purification techniques around 1960. Subsequently, there was an improved design and coating for better hemocompatibility, and today we have a large spectrum of devices and sorbent biomaterials. So in the 60s, when the first hemoperfusion was uh, operated, we were still using the rotating drum of uh, uh, Professor Kolf, and the pioneering hemoperfusion demonstrated this new technique in which a unit containing sorbent material could absorb different substances from the blood into an extracorporeal circulation. Unfortunately, chills, fevers, cutaneous rash, thrombocytopenia, side effects were mostly due to the fact that uh, uh, the chemocompatibility of these uh, 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 cartridges were not optimized. And only subsequently, there was an improvement and cartridges were mostly utilized for uh, uh, intoxication. But let's now see what the present is. We have two types of mass separation barriers. One is based on membrane and the other is based on solid agent. And if you look at the spectrum of molecular weights that we have in uremia and acute kidney injury, you immediately realize that we must use all the different uh, technologies. Because there are limitations in diffusion due to the limited diffusion coefficient as the molecular weight increase in the solute. On the other hand, when we use convection, there is a limitation in permeability imposed by the porosity of the membrane. Now, we are using a new nomenclature, and this is published in a recent book from Professor Bellomo and myself, 
that uh, prefer use the term hemoadsorption for the use of adsorbent in extracorporeal blood purification therapies. What are the advantages? To overcome the limitations of dialysis treatments, the large spectrum of solute removal, and the possibility to use different techniques. But of course, we require an effective and safe sorbent material, stable and hemocompatible. We need a good unit, no clotting activation, no side effects, and easy application of the techniques. What sorbents do we have available? Sorbents can be natural or synthetic, and mostly we are using today polymeric substances with a very high surface to volume ratio. They come in different formats, mostly we have seen recently in beads, with a structure that can be macro, meso, or microporous, depending on the porosity and the size of the pores. So you see immediately from this slide on the left the structure of uh, uh, carbon sorbents that are very rough and definitely not biocompatible. On the other hand, you see that uh, polymeric model resins can actually become very, very important, although we have sometimes a problem of stability of the resin because some cracking may occur. The innovative uh, Jaffron Neutroporous Microporous Resin, I think, uh, has changed completely the horizon of absorption in recent years, providing a very biocompatible uh, uh, material. And there is a possibility today to study the material comparing by spectrophotometric analysis uh, to different libraries and to determine the pore size and pore distribution of the uh, uh, material. How do we define the, how we do characterize the sorbent? Well, we have a curve which is similar to the one we use for dialysis membrane. In one axis, we have uh, uh, the uh, pore density, the number of pores per surface area, and on the other axis, we have pore size distribution. Now, of course, we use uh, to test sorbents, curves called isotherms that uh, uh, are helpful in the laboratory to understand how much sorbent uh, is needed to absorb a certain amount of substance. So these isotherms, as you can see here, can be influenced by the pore density. A specific molecule will have a different uh, uh, isotherm depending on the porosity. And also, the pore size distribution will affect the different isotherms for different solutes. Now, it seems that uh, it's very interesting today that uh, Jaffron has a proprietary technology to make a nanoscale molecular sieve control, adjusting the pore size distribution according to the target molecular weight and radius of the substances. So, if you see here the uh, curve of pore density and pore size distribution, you may have a microporous, you have a mesoporous, you may have a macroporous, depending on the characteristic of the target solutes you want to remove. And here you see that uh, different target molecules may represent small molecular weight toxin, may represent middle, molecular weight toxin, large molecules, and even protein-bound toxin. There is a possibility to analyze by microscopy, especially with electroscanning techniques, not only the surface of the sorbent, but also the internal structure and the nature of the different pores. Of course, all the effort should be made to generate a sorbent which is biocompatible. And we have tested in our laboratory the biocompatibility, or even better, the hemocompatibility of the sorbent materials uh, included in these um, cartridges that you see. And both in static and dynamic tests, 
we could not find any difference in terms of viability, apoptosis, or necrosis of the cells incubated with the biomaterial. Of course, in order to prevent interaction with cells and major proteins, the external surface of the sorbent need to be coated. And there are coating of different uh, thickness and there is a development uh, today of a technology to make coating very, very, very thin in order to prevent uh, uh, interaction with uh, cells. However, there is a problem because when you try to coat a bead, the diffusion of the solute inside the bead may be limited. And this was one of the first experiments we did uh, almost 25 years ago now on an uh, original uh, sorbent that showed that the coating could not really uh, uh, permit uh, uh, diffusion of the solute inside. So we have to consider the different flow of the fluid phase through the sorbent in terms of interparticle flow, extraparticle flow, and also intraparticle flow with internal convection. And you see that the flow of the uh, fluid phase sometimes has to go through the bead inside. At this point, uh, coating must not prevent the diffusion of different molecules uh, from outside to inside the bead. And uh, in this case, as you can see here, porosity and coating must be combined. The reason for this is that not only on the surface, but also inside the molecule, we have hydrophobic bonds and ionic bonds. In this case, the, let's say the interaction is deterministic, is like a binary inter interaction, yes or, yes or no. But when you have van der Waal forces that uh, involve the interaction of electrons with the nucleus of another component, you are entering somehow a quantum mechanics and the determination of this phenomenon becomes extremely complex. On the other hand, once the sorbent is generated, you need a good blood pathway and a good flow dynamic inside the cartridge. And this is regulated and governed by different physical laws and by variables such as particle diameter, density of the, pack, of the packing, interparticle porosity, path tortuosity, length and diameter of the unit, fluid viscosity, and turbulence. Every single component must be optimized in order to achieve an optimal flow. But of course, we tested this in our laboratory, and we found a very homogeneous progression of the blood flow through the uh, sorbent, demonstrating that uh, there is a, a perfect optimization of the interparticle uh, uh, path in the unit. We also did some experimental studies to try to see if the optimization of utilization of the sorbent is maximized. And this is a calculation of a very complex parameter called mass transfer zone that we, we studied by putting some specific probes inside the, uh, uh, the unit. How do we use the sorbent once we have a good sorbent, we have generated a good unit? We have different type of techniques. One is hemoadsorption classic the old hemoperfusion. The other is plasma filtration adsorption. So you circulate plasma after you separate plasma from the blood. The other is uh, this treatment combined with the CRRT or with hemodialysis. But we have also new treatments such as the double plasma filtration molecular adsorption system, which combines two different types of sorbents in the circulation of the plasma. Finally, hemoadsorption can be combined with hemodialysis and uh, CRRT, and we have today options both for the chronic and the acute patients. In fact, for the chronic patient, coupling adsorption with uh, dialysis may be an interesting option because many of the uremium retention products and molecules 
are in the range of molecular weight that exceed the capacity of membrane to remove. And these retention molecules tend to affect different organ functions, leading to poor outcomes and poor quality of life. Here you see, for example, for the different classes of solutes from small to essential proteins, that indeed high flux membranes have very limited capacity to remove these solutes compared, for example, to the kidney. So current dialysis techniques have limited capabilities. Now, it has been mentioned before that uh, there was a trial in Shanghai where they compare a group of patients treated uh, with uh, hemoadsorption plus hemodialysis versus hemodialysis alone. And the result was very interesting because there was a significant reduction in inflammatory mediators, beta-2 microglobulin and PTH, reduction of cardiovascular events, and all-cause mortality. And also, every patient had a significant improvement in quality of life. Now, this study was done in 1,400 patients. So it is a very large study. And there is another study from Beijing that was done on more than 400 patients who actually compare the same type of group, but using also high and low flux membranes. And what they found was that when you use adsorption, the results are achieved independently on the use of high or low flux membranes. So we did uh, a recent uh, meta-analysis, and the overall survival at two years, even in randomized trials or cohort studies, seems to favor the utilization of combination of hemoadsorption plus hemodialysis. And we were able to conclude in our uh, 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 study that uh, hemoperfusion plus hemodialysis removes substances such as PTH, beta-2, and other solutes in a more effective way compared to classic hemodialysis. But there is also a significant improvement in the clinical outcomes and the quality of life of patients. In the safety analysis study, it was uh, very clear that there were no specific complications related to the adjunction of uh, adsorption to the circuit. Now, I made recently a kinetic studies to show that uh, the addition of uh, hemoperfusion in a single session is able to reduce beta-2 microglobulin in a more effective way compared to other treatments. And so you see when you use, for example, three sessions per week regime, that you lower the concentration of beta-2 microglobulin. But what is interesting is then when you move to subsequent sessions and you have, after the attack phase, two sessions per week, and even one session per week, the time average concentration of beta-2 microglobulin decrease and remain low, including also PTH, CRP, ferritin, HMGB1, with increase in albumin, hemoglobin, and reduced need of erythropoietin. Now, the theory that I have put forward for this response is the following. Not only you remove uh, 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 in dialysis, sorry, you have insufficient removal of beta-2, but also you have a smoldering inflammation that may lead to an increased generation of beta-2 microglobulin and increase the complication. In hemoadsorption plus hemodialysis, not only you remove more beta-2 microglobulin, but you also remove part of the inflammation leading to a reduction in the generation of beta-2 microglobulin, which may be a new interesting paradigm. So today we have studies that uh, propose indications for this treatment, such as chronic inflammation, beta-2 accumulation, anorexia, malnutrition, pruritus, uremic syndromes, muscular weakness, sleep disorders, osteoarticular pain, and there are, in studies, documented effects on improvement of several of these signs and symptoms. For this reason, I wrote an editorial in blood purification writing that uh, 
the results of the two randomized trials combined with other observational studies led me to say that probably absorption is the new frontier offering new options for our patients. When there was no dialysis, there was no survival. When we started the sufficient treatment, we started some survival. And when we started the working on adequacy of dialysis, we noticed an acceptable life. Of course, the cost increased progressively. But we come back to the cost issue later on. Certainly, adsorption may probably offer the next step in terms of complete rehabilitation of the patient. So I think we are exploring a new frontier, and we need to identify patient subgroups that are likely to benefit from hemoadsorption and hemodialysis. We need to establish adequate dose, frequency, and also target molecules in order to monitor the results. We need to identify adequate endpoints for clinical trials. We need to consider potential side effects and manage possible complications to promote a full range of research to establish solid evidence. And we need to define cost-benefit ratios based on patient-centered approach. We need to offer dialysis patients a new option. Now let me move to the acute uh, side of the story. As you know, AKI represents one of the major killers for critical ill patients, and today we know very well that there is sepsis and septic shock as a major cause of uh, AKI uh, uh, um, developing in the ICU. Now, when you have an ischemia reperfusion or a toxic insult to the kidney, this goes through a damage and exfoliation of cells in the tubular lumen, and you already notice a direct damage to the kidney. You can only prevent this if you make preventive and protective measures that eliminate the toxics or reduce the ischemia in the kidney. But what happened with the septic AKI? There are microcirculation problems, inflammation, mitochondrial dysfunction. We have to concentrate on this pathophysiological mechanism. And in a recent uh, uh, study, it has been demonstrated that two things are important. One, patients with sepsis-associated AKI tend to, uh, let's say, uh, be diagnosed with stage one AKI based on uh, low urine output. The second thing is that it has been calculated that maybe one quarter of these cases can be preventable. Now, if you consider moving from non-AKI to a damaged situation or a dysfunction situation, which is more common in uh, sepsis, you know that we have uh, risk modifiers such as uh, inflammation, nephrotoxic drugs, uh, uh, anemia, congestion, that may increase the risk to worsen the AKI condition. At the same time, however, we have mitigation strategies that help to prevent and protect from AKI. And the least, the most important uh, aspect in this case, probably, is the control of inflammation. Why does GFR fall in sepsis? Why do you see a stage one AKI with low urine output, contrary to what we expected and studied in the past, today we know that there is a generalized arterial vasodilatation in the kidney, and there is especially a vasodilatation in the efferent arteriole. Rinaldo Bellomo has clearly shown that if you inject LPS in an animal and you make it septic, AKI does not result from a decrease in blood flow, but rather there is an increase in blood flow with a reduction, with an increase also in renal conductance. So we have in sepsis late or no creatinine increase. We have increase in renal blood flow, decrease in GFR, decrease in urine output, and there is an increase in circulating cytokines that may induce a certain level of vasoplegia, 
All this affects oliguria. So if this is true, can we try to eliminate uh, these pathogen and danger associated molecular patterns and cytokines that induce this condition? In other words, the cytokine release syndrome may be at the center of the initial dysfunction of the kidney in sepsis associated AKI before any damage occurred, making this possibly reversible and making cytokine as a target for therapy. Now, cytokine release syndrome is a systematic inflammatory response triggered by different conditions, and we know that release of cytokine into the blood may affect kidney function and different type of organ dysfunction. For example, uh, macro, uh, macrophage activation, CAR T therapy, sepsis, <coughs> viral infection may initiate a cascade with activation of the immune, in, innate immunity and activation of a pro-inflammatory response. But also, subsequently, there is a counter-inflammatory response with activation of the adaptive uh, immunity, and all these derangements may affect uh, subsequently endothelial dysfunction and organ failure. The peak concentration hypothesis that we have uh, put together some years ago suggested that you can actually achieve some level of immunohomeostasis when you use a, a specific removal of uh, cytokines in these patients, showing that not necessarily one or another cytokine should be removed, but rather the entire system should be reset. The acute disease quality initiative uh, was uh, very, very clear, saying that extracorporeal blood purification techniques can be used to remove pathogens, toxins, and inflammatory mediators and also that initiation of this therapy in sepsis might be considered for immunomodulatory effect. When you claim that uh, you want to remove cytokine, you have to be sure that this happens. And this is a typical study we did in vitro showing a capacity of removal of uh, uh, the uh, raising in terms of cytokine. And you see, we used uh, some mini modules uh, that are specifically for in vitro experiments. But also, we put forward the concept that sepsis is a cascade of events. And while at the very initial phase, you may have the presence of pathogens or endotoxin, and you may actually have absorption for those substances in the middle the disruption of the immune response is probably due to cytokines, pathogen and danger associated molecular patterns. And here is where the sorbent, uh, uh, in this case, for example, we use the HA380 cartridge is indicated. So what is the typical finding that uh, we see when we treat the patient with the cytokine release syndrome? we see a typical rapid reduction in circulating cytokines, but also we see a specific and interesting improvement in hemodynamics with marginal or no changes in platelet count and albumin. This lead to the idea on how to design a trial for acute patients, where we need to clarify the phenotype up to the endotype, even trying to study the genome of the patient uh, that uh, we want to treat in order to achieve clear indication criteria, a good selection of the population, identify subphenotype of patient, and defining the target effect. And we have a hierarchy of endpoints that go from biochemical solutes, biological cellular effect, physiological vital parameters, clinical organ function, severity score, and finally, mortality is the latest type of endpoint. I want to share with you some results that we achieved treating septic patient uh, with hemoabsorption. Specifically, not only we achieved reduction in cytokines and significant reduction in the requirement of vasopressor support, achieving a good hemodynamic stability, but we found a profound change in the response of the monocytes, 
leading to secretion of TNF when incubated with LPS and improving phagocytosis. So there is a decrease in the propotogenic potential of the plasma, an improvement in phagocytosis, and most of all, we noticed an increase in HLADR expression by monocytes, which demonstrate the return to the capacity to present the antigen. This has been demonstrated in some uh, in vivo studies. This is a study on 44 septic patients where there was a change in uh, typically uh, cytokine concentration, but most of all there was a change in SOFA score, showing that independently of what we measure or not measure, there was a biological and clinical effect. This was a patient we treated uh, during uh, COVID, admitted with fever, hypotension, respiratory failure, placed on mechanical ventilation. He presented with hemodynamic instability, a very high inflammatory profile. We treated the patient for three sessions in three subsequent days, and the hemodynamic stabilization and normalization of cytokine levels led to decrease in inflammatory parameters, improved pulmonary exchange, and extubation. When you use sorbents, you must be aware of what is the isotherm for the substance. And in most cases, we have seen that saturation of the sorbents occur between 6 and 12 hours. So it makes no sense to treat the patient with longer time. For this reason, our protocol suggests to have a short sessions uh, with uh, uh, some interval maybe two sessions in the first day and optional session in the second and third day. That is the moment in which you can change the course of sepsis-associated AKI. You must also be aware that when you treat a patient with absorption, you remove beneficial drugs, including antibiotics. And therefore, you must know that antibiotics must be administered in the right interval. But hemoabsorption is classically also used for intoxication and poisoning. And this is one of the clearest indications, especially for drug intoxication and biotoxin. We recently studied about other things, and Professor Fethi Gul from Turkey will probably present later on. We studied the capacity to remove myoglobin in rhabdomyolysis condition. We studied the capacity to remove bilirubin and bile acids, which will be strongly supported by the Padstone study that Professor Chen is going to conclude within the 2024. And this will be a very, very important study done on 1,300 patients with the compensated liver failure using DP mass. And this is the treatment, basically, that has the beneficial effect not only to remove bilirubin, but also to remove uh, inflammatory mediators that seems to be at the base of the liver dysfunction, or at least in part of the liver dysfunction. A recent meta-analysis comparing DP mass plus plasma exchange versus plasma exchange alone seems to display a superiority of this uh, uh, treatment. Also, we can apply adsorption in the cardiopulmonary bypass, or we can apply it in the ECMO patient. Some results have been controversial, and we need more studies in this area. But there is no question that there is a significant reduction of the circulating level of pro-inflammatory mediators. So where are we today in critically ill patients? We are today where CRRT were 30 years ago. And we need structural research. We need to identify patient endophenotypes that are likely to benefit from MIMO adsorption. Not every patient will benefit. And if we recruit every patient in a study, the results will be neutral. So we need to identify the right patient, establish the adequate dose, frequency, and criteria for application. We need to identify target molecules and biomarkers that allow us to do biomonitoring. We need to identify adequate endpoints according to the hierarchy that I have shown to you before in order to make effective clinical trials. 
We need also to consider potential side effects and contraindication. And we need to promote a medical academic alliance with industry for progress also to use terminology that is homogeneous because our nurses require specific orders in order to make delivery exactly adherent to the prescription. One last uh, uh, comment is about uh, cost effectiveness. We all know that uh, uh, if you use uh, a uh, less expensive therapy, very often you might have a limited effect. And this is mostly what is done in uh, budget uh, uh, priority consideration. In some cases, you may end up spending more because the complications may affect hospitalization. If you look uh, in a different perspective, and you try to improve the quality of the treatment, you may have the result, but if you don't do that, you may have a worsening of the outcomes, and from the ethical perspective, this is not acceptable. On the other hand, if you have an increase in expenditure, and this improve slightly the uh, uh, outcomes, you may consider that it is true that you spend more money, but in a large scale approach, subsequently, the cost of the technology may decrease, as it has occurred for hemodialysis, for example. But if you look this from the ethical point of view, when you have a positive result from spending a little more, I think that you might try to reduce the cost, maintaining or even improving the quality. And this is a patient-centered approach. We will discuss about this in our meeting in Vicenza next year. You will be all invited. I hope to have you there. Maybe we will do a very interesting absorption forum. Quickly, let's go back to the future. The future of sorbents uh, may lie in different polymer blending and coating, in different polymer composition and structure, in surface functionalization and selective absorption, priming beads for drugs and enzyme delivery, using nanotubes and nanoparticles, using cartridges with lighter case and environmental friendly materials, possibly regenerating in some cases. Instead of coating, in some cases, you may use micro domains that makes the sorbent hydrophilic hydrophobic and therefore, you don't put any membrane in between solutes and the sorbent. You just change the structure, and you can do this by altering the composition of the polymer. Microtubes or nanotubes and nanofibers can be spun using new electrospinning technology. Maybe in the future, the beads will not be the solution. Who knows? We need to study this aspect. But sure, we know that today we have nanofibers that can actually elute drugs and use desorption to treat patients. Surface functionalization is an extremely important aspect because it may change completely the interaction with coagulation and fooling effect, making possible in the future regeneration. And we have examples today of functionalized sorbents like polyamide fiber uh, functionalized with DIA, polystyrenic fibers functionalized with polymyxin B, or copolymeric particles like styrene divinyl benzene cross linked We have made a test in our laboratory. We have functionalized uh, a, a sorbent with vancomycin. And what we found is that if you circulate uh, blood with uh, bacteria, the system maintains the killing capacity for bacteria without delivering the drug to the patient, which means that for special drugs, this could be a very interesting option. We also try to functionalize with vitamin E, showing a slight decrease in the activated oxygen products that are produced by oxidant stress. We also may consider in the future using sorbents for waterless dialysis techniques and wearable technology. 
for the combination of sorbents and olefiber in a single unit, co-extrusion of membrane and sorbent combining diffusion and adsorption, even in a single device, may be a new clinical indication, combination of physical and chemical mechanisms, and use of sorbents beyond extracorporeal therapies. I just remind you that we have used sorbents to test the hypothesis of using a wearable artificial kidney, which is based on the old experience of the ready system. Maybe combination of the two devices in one device will be an interesting intermediate solution. Maybe the embedding the fiber in a sorbent bed or co-extruding the fiber with the sorbent may represent an interesting solution. Maybe combining plasma filtration absorption in a single device could be an interesting solution. Certainly, new indication may emerge. For example, we have tested the capacity to remove dye in patients that received uh, uh, contrast uh, imaging techniques. It might be a very interesting approach because in one hour, you remove almost everything. Recently, we also studied the PFAS removal for drinking waters, and the removal capacity is astonishing, showing also the possibility to treat some patients that have been exposed for a long time. Combining physical mechanisms, we have tested the possibility to use vibration with different frequencies and amplitudes, and we have studied this in vitro, analyzing different type of molecules. Finally, using electromagnetic fields and particles that have been already studied, in other words, from the aspecific, poorly biocompatible sorbent, problematic, we have moved now to the optimized sorbent. But in the future, hopefully, we will move to smart sorbents. And in conclusion, I may tell you that adsorption represent a very interesting option for blood purification, giving new opportunities. Different sorbent materials are available for specific and aspecific solid removal. Modern sorbents are safe, biocompatible, and effective. Sorbent composition and structure can be optimized and tested with isotherms. Different options and techniques are available for utilization of sorbents in practice. Sorbents may be the doorway to wearable and waterless dialysis. Adsorption represents the new frontier in extracorporeal blood purification. But more research is required, and I think that the commitment that we should have from this uh, forum and summit is to do more research in this area. Just working together is the solution for a bright future. And with this, I thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Bumpo. Please return to your seat.